Um, so uh, I'm I'm uh, uh, good friends with John Casson. We've known each other since college uh, for you know the better part of 20 years. And um, when uh, he got promoted to sport education director, uh, he sent me an email and asked me if I wanted his, his old job. And since skiing and snowboarding is my passion, um, I jumped at the chance. Uh, immediately. So I've been in this role for uh, uh, about a year now and um, I'm helping uh, U.S. Ski and Snowboard to develop a comprehensive uh, level 100 coach uh, education curriculum. So um, what I'm going to try to do today, I've been in a lot of these webinars and a lot of them you kind of walk away and think, man, that was inspirational. Um, but I don't really have anything that you know that can help me immediately. So my goal today is to kind of give you guys some tools and some things to think about um, with developing your own curriculum. So to start this off, there's a there's a really great um, book by a guy named Simon Sinek. You, you might have uh, read it, but it's for, for me it was really inspirational because it kind of changed my mindset on really what it means to develop curriculum and, and why you want to do it. So we're going to start off with this little five minute um, video and then I'm going to take it from there. So hopefully you guys can see my screen and, and hear what he has to say. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. Nah. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients to do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. 
is Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. When we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and the figures and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't the other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain. The part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal? Okay, so that was a great introduction to this presentation. And, you know, when you think about developing curriculum, um, a lot of people are like, okay, you know, they, they start with the what and what, they're, what they need to include. Or, you know, it's going to have you learning. It's going to be blended. Um, you know, we're going to have, you know, an exam. And really what you need to do is really turn it around and think about the why and, and, and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, as Sam pointed out, I put two links um, in the chat window if you haven't already accessed them. One is to my outline of what I'm going to go through today. And um, the other one is to um, this portfolio that I created actually when I was looking for a job a long time ago. Um, and uh, it just kind of seemed to fit the, the nature of what I was going to speak about today. So I, I thought I'd use it as a, as a good visual aid for you. So you can open those things up uh, yourself. And as when we get into talking about adult learning, many of you are going to be listening to me halfway and scrolling through the outline or uh, looking through the portfolio as you listen. You're going to take different learning paths, as we're going to discuss here in a second. So. Um, so the golden circle really explains the way you want to start developing curriculum and you want to start with why. So for, for us at US Ski and Snowboard, you know, John and I had several conversations and, and, you know, what he wanted to do was create a curriculum that was going to provide coaches with the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they need to make a positive impact on the lives of their athletes. And so once we had the focus and the why, the next thing was the how. Well, how are we going to do it? Um, so if we go here, okay, this is called a Wordle. It's a great way to put um, different concepts together into a, a nice visual image. And this is really the, the heart of instructional design. And you may recognize some things here, or you know, for a lot of you, maybe a lot of this is going to be new, but. Um, in talking about uh, the how, things that you need to identify, A, are things like, um, you know, uh, doing research and, and finding out what is, what is the you know, latest information in the world of instructional design, or looking at models, the Addy model we'll talk about here in a second, um, or, you know, the, the whole process of instructional design, what, what that means and how the gap analysis is a component of that. Um, so the next thing we're gonna I want to show you here is uh, the components. So um, in the how, when you're developing a curriculum, you need to think about several things. And the first thing is what what's going to be the heart of the beast? What are you, you know, what are you going to base your curriculum on? And that starts with educational theories. And you know, there's there's a ton of educational theories out there, and we could talk about that ad nauseum for days and days and days. But I'm just going to introduce you to a couple that you know um, struck me as interesting and and um, had those concepts that I wanted to uh, develop into the curriculum that I wrote. So 
we'll talk about that. And then uh, design models, like you know, I introduced you just a second ago to the ADDI model. ADDI stands for Analyze, Design, Develop, um, and Evaluate, Implement and Evaluate. So that's a that's a very general process for creating a curriculum, and we'll talk more in depth about that. Um, and then what instructional strategies are you going to use to um, get the information out to your learners? And then finally, what technology are you going to um, to harness? Uh, so, so the next place we're going to go is um, educational theories. And um, on this outline, I put a link up here for this website. I, you know, this is a really great website that I refer to over and over again. And this is kind of a a um, culmination of you know a, a ton of theories that you can look at and and kind of get ideas from. Um, you know, for me, there were several that I put in in this portfolio that kind of were striking um, and that you know we're using at U.S. Ski and Snowboard. One is the cognitive apprenticeship. Um, and you know you can you can read through these. That's oh, freaking out. That's interesting. <laughs> Let me re. Redo that. Uh, the next one is social development theory by Vygotsky. Uh, flow theory by, I love this guy's name, Chick Sent Me High uh, is his name. Uh, we use Bloom's Taxonomy uh, to write our learning objectives and competency. Um, Bloom's Taxonomy is basically a model of, um, you know, looking at content and thinking about um, where you want your learner to be, what, what you ultimately want them to accomplish. So do you want them to know something or comprehend it or be able to apply it or analyze it? And then these two, um, there's a new model by Anderson and Crathwell that actually switched these two around. So um, they felt that, you know, if you're synthesizing something, that's something brand new and that's at a higher level than evaluation. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're creating a, you know, a whole, like so for U.S. Ski and Snowboard, we're creating a whole new curriculum. We're synthesizing something totally new that hasn't been done before. Uh, so we're operating in cur developing this curriculum up here at the top of the pinnacle. Um, so that's Bloom. And then the ARCS model stands for attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. So those are you know really impactful things that you want to think about when you're creating curriculum for a group of people. A, why are you doing it? Um, what are you trying to accomplish? How are you going to do it so that it's relevant? It's, you know, you're uh, building confidence and they're satisfied with the content. Okay, next thing to consider are some educational models. So these kind of serve as the framework for helping you put things together. Uh, the first one, as I introduced before, is the ADDI model. Um, again, it stands for Analyze, Design, Develop, Implement, and Evaluate. So these are the steps that you do. So for U.S. Ski and Snowboard, the first thing that we did was to take a look at, um, you know, what what was there before, um, before we started to tinker with the machine. And we did a gap analysis to see, okay, you know, we, we know where we want to go. Uh, what do we have to get us there? What do we need to create? Um, and then there, from there, we started to design the curriculum. Um, right now, we're in, in this cog right here. We're developing the curriculum, and then at the end of this month, we're going to release it to our candidates. So then we'll be in the implement, and then we'll continue into the evaluation stage. So this is a really basic model. Uh, to get more in-depth into that and, and dig down another layer, is the Dick and Carry model, and you know, at the heart of what we're doing, this is really the steps we're following, and and I'll give you um, a, a rundown of this uh, later in the presentation. But these are very systematic steps that take you through how to develop a curriculum, from identifying your instructional goals to writing, you know, what what do you want your learners or your candidates uh, to be able to do at the end of the curriculum. Um, then, you know, 
how are you going to um, evaluate them on their understanding? And then you develop your instructional strategy. You know, what, how, how are you going to engage them? Is there going to be face-to-face -face activities? Or are you going to do a lot of it on, on the web? Or you, um, you know, how, how are you going to go about it? And then you develop your instructional materials. What, what are you going to include? Are there going to be online modules? Are there going to be, you know, what specific activities are you going to, um, embed in your curriculum? Um, and then you, um, at, at the end of all this, you want to, you want to, um, conduct a formative evaluation of your curriculum by a focus group. So, you know, as we've been creating content, we've been, um, getting our working groups involved to review what we're putting together to make sure that it's on point with what the uh, level 100 candidates need. And then, you know, once the course is already built and put up on our uh, LMS, we'll have a focus group go through it to make sure it makes sense. Um, and then the next step is to develop and conduct a summative evaluation. This is where you look at the, you know, what the what the learners or the candidates are doing in the course and um, and how they're doing on their evaluations. I mean, if you have you know 75% of your population bombing your exam, well, uh, there's a good chance that you didn't present the information effectively. Or um, you know, if if everyone is passing with 100, maybe it's uh, not rigorous enough. So you need to um, evaluate the outcome of uh, of what you're trying to accomplish. And then another good way to do this is through surveys. And then, um, then you want to then, you know, over time, you're going to be changing um, the amount of or the, the level of knowledge and the ability of your population as coaches talk to other coaches. And, you know, the, your, your education starts to get embedded into the community. So maybe, you know, hopefully over time what you're going to see is that you're tests, the, 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 the average score on your tests are going to get higher. So you might need to tweak this and make your curriculum a little more rigorous through time as you're bringing up the knowledge base of your learners. So this is called the Dick and Carry model. Um, really, really impactful. Great, uh, great way to, to go about developing curriculum. Uh, the next one, the next one is Gagne's nine events of instruction. And this is really, you know, um, a, a focus on how to implement the curriculum with your learners. What you know, how how to engage them into the elements that that you're creating. So there's nine steps here: gain attention, inform learners of the objective. Really important in adult learning. They want to know what what they're learning and how it applies to their profession. Uh, stimulate recall of prior knowledge. You know, as adult learners, um, everyone has a a, um, a set of experiences that they 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 call upon when learning new stuff to see how it integrates into the new stuff that they're learning. Um, present the content, provide learning guidance, elicit performance, provide feedback, assess performance, and enhance retention and transfer. This is a really important one right here, especially for adult learners. Um, you want to be able to give them a curriculum and then have them implement it into their job and then see change. Uh, the next one, Kirkpatrick, uh, this model evaluates uh, learner engagement. So it looks at satisfaction, how much learning took place, what the impact was, uh, what results are occurring in the population. And then ultimately, what is your return on investment or your ROI? And then the next one that I wanted to um, show you here is, uh, let's see how I can do this. I think I can just embed this right there. Hopefully you guys can see this. Um, so when I was at American Public University, uh, you know, they have over, I don't know, 140, when I was there, it was at 144,000 students worldwide in the university. And this was their model, um, for creating their content. And, you know, it, it's really stuck with me through the years because ultimately this is what you're trying to accomplish. So this has, you know, in this Venn diagram, it has three, uh, general circles. One is the cognitive presence or the content that the curriculum has. 
The next one is teaching presence or the interaction between the learner and um, you know the more knowledgeable other person or the instructor. And then the social presence. And this, you know, as as you guys can see today, why you're all here is that you know we're uh, humans are social and, and they like to get together and, and learn things. Um, learn things collaboratively. So social presence is a really important uh, part to build into a curriculum. And then in, in the center circles, you know, surrounding the learner's educational experiences, you know, how are you going to support it? Um, what content are you going to embed? And, how, and this is a really important one that's often forgotten about is the climate. Um, you know, when you're creating training for, say, a group of carpenters or you know, uh, police officers or skiers, the climate for that educational model is going to be a lot different and you really need to think about, you know, this as you're creating your curriculum. What do, what, what is common in the community? All right. All right, next are the instructional strategies. So this, the instructional strategies are really how are you going to engage the learner? What is your curriculum going to look like? Is it going to be, you know, a lecture of, you know, face-to-face -face 60 minutes three times a week or are you going to embed e-learning into it? Um, is it going to be blended? You know, you need to think about the delivery. How are you going to deliver that, that information to this community? And then, you know, as we are focusing on today is um, adult learning theory. And you know the, the the essence really of adult learning theory are um, a it needs to be accessible. Um, everyone needs to be able to get to it easily. You know, as adults, we're all super busy and we're pulled in um, a multitude of different directions. So it has to be accessible. It has to be relevant to the population. It has to you know you in, in the in the when you figured out the why of what you're creating. Um, hopefully, when you took that step, you thought about the relevancy of what you're trying to create. Uh, next, it has to be engaging for adults. You know, they you, you in, in today's world, you just can't give them a manual. Here's a manual. Read the manual. You know, it, it with what we have available through e-learning and simulations and branching scenarios and different ways to engage people. You need to make your content engaging to keep them keep them going forward. Uh, next, it has to be impactful. You, it, it needs to uh, make a change in in their you know in their training what what you're trying to accomplish. And then next, now you know I put this in last minute. Um, it needs to be social as much as it can. And and when you look at the COI model, you know that was a whole big circle social presence. So how are you going to create opportunities for uh, adult learners to work together um, and and come up with uh, collaborative you know, in, collaborative activities. Uh, so one thing I wanted to show you in here um, was let's see where would I put that recommendations. Um, when I was at uh, Western Governors University, they used this, and I'm actually going to um, I'm going to send this to our HR department. At, you know, as I was getting ready for this presentation, I, I thought about this, and I haven't thought about this for a long time. But motivosity is a really great way of getting people involved in, um, you know, working together and thanking everyone for, you know, the work that they do for one another. So um, you can check this out online um, if you just search motivosity. But you know, you can see here when in, in this instructional design department that I was working in, you know, people would just say thanks for. Um, you know, helping helping one another out, and it was a great way to motivate the team and really create a collaborative environment that helped us all move forward with a common purpose. Uh, so I, I wanted to introduce that quickly. Okay, uh, the next thing here is the technology. So you know, say you want to go down. The root, you know, e-learning right now is a, a, a really um, hot topic, and ev you know everybody's trying to get uh, e-learning into their curriculum development because of the accessibility that it provides for their community. And um, 
there's a lot of things you really need to think hard on if you want to go down this route. One is, you know, what LMS are you going to use? There's so many different LMSs out there, um, and they're they're all very different from one another. Next is the product development. You know, there's a, there's definitely a uh, a staged uh, sequential way to create really good um, uh, content. So you know, one thing I I encourage you is to um, definitely become familiar with. Adobe Creative Cloud, you know, with Photoshop and Illustrator and Premiere, um, you can really do some some pretty awesome uh, things to bring your e-learning to life. Um, another one that I wanted to share with you too that I just found not too long ago is called H5P, and I'm using this to create interactive videos um, so that you know you're you're actually so the video doesn't isn't a, a passive environment, but you know becomes interactive. So the the learner is engaged in whatever it is going on in the video. As you can kind of see a demo right right there. Uh, so technology is a big part of this. Um, another thing I wanted to you know if you're going down the e-learning route. Um, we just found this, or I just found this about six months ago. Uh, this is called Adapt, and Adapt is an open source, free e-learning uh, builder. Um, and you know, if you have an IT department um, that you can work with, we just got uh, this put onto a server for us to use to build our e-learning. And Adapt really is a game changer. And I'm kind of going to jump ahead. I was because I'm afraid of we're going to run out of time. But so um, at US Ski and Snowboard, uh, here is a prototype. Now, this is definitely in the prototype stage. Um, but this is the coaching roles and responsibilities module that I'm creating right now. And this really lets you, this, is, this was developed in ADAPT. And it lets you, A, brand your course, which is important. You want to brand it for whatever the colors and the fonts are of the company that you're working for, and it you know allows you to put really nice backgrounds and scroll the content like this, and then you know you can really so in this you can see I start with the competencies and learning objectives, and then I go into this is a really nice tool. So this is a confidence slider and allows the learner to evaluate their ability to put these competencies and learning objectives into action in their job and then say and say on a scale of 1 to 10 how confident are you to do that and then they can figure out you know where they are click submit and they get you know uh, they get some feedback here um, so when you're building e learning it's really important to engage don't just put content up there that the you know the, the user is passively going through but takes an active role um, as you can see down here, I have some tabs that they can click on. Um, here's some accordions. Accordions are great because you can see a general list of uh, things that go together, and then you can also provide additional information in them. Uh, so as we scroll down, you can see the backgrounds change, and you can see how I incorporated the branding of the company into the overall user experience. And then down here, this is important, uh, putting in a knowledge check to say, okay, there was the information. Once again, I'm engaging the learner. What, what did you learn from this material? And they can go through these. These are no stakes, just a formative assessment on letting them go through and see if they got the information that they were supposed to. And then, um, then there's a wrap-up section where you ask that question again. Okay, now that you went through this information, now how confident are you? And hopefully you see, you know, people after they go through your information are very confident, and then they get uh, some feedback on that um, conclusion. And then, okay, I'll talk about that in a second. So, so that's kind of wrapping up, talking about the. The, the how and the what. You know, how are you going to develop it? What are you going to create? 
Um, so, you know, going back to um, U.S. ski and snowboard and applying the Dick and Carry model, um, you know, we decided that we were going to divide our curriculum into two parts. One was going to be, and I can put this up here. Uh, one was going to be um, a, a cluster of modules we were calling the coaching core, and they included coaching roles and responsibilities, ethics and philosophy, long-term athletic development, physical fitness, mental skills, coaching pedagogy, and we just uh, put this new one in, training environment. So all coaches in all disciplines are going to get this cluster. And then we're going to create a specific module for each discipline on those matters that impact, um, you know, e each one specifically. So each one's going to have the, the equipment, the technique, the tactics, and the competition. Um, so that was how we um, identified our instructional goals. Then. Uh, to identify entry behaviors and construct instructional analysis. What we did here is we talked to experts in the field to say, you know, what, what do the learners need to learn? Where do you see gaps from, you know, the, the candidates or the, the coaches that you're working with um, and, you know, what you think that they should have at this level? And then from there, we developed our, um, you know, our, our competencies and learning objectives. And then we looked at, you know, what what is the curriculum going to contain? What are the performance objectives? So we decided that in our model, we're going to do, uh, we're going to have coaches go through an, a, a cluster of e-learning modules that I just uh, showed you. Then they're going to um, go to an on-snow component, and they're going to uh, go through a series of cohort discussions. And then uh, it'll the, as far as the performance objectives, it'll culminate with some on-snow activities on their ability to, you know, teach, uh, provide demos, um, act in certain scenarios, those kind of things. So what we tried to accomplish here was to increase the candidate's knowledge, skills, and abilities. And then we had to look at our assessment plan. How are we going to assess learners? Well, um, I just showed you those formative knowledge check questions that are going to be in the module. And then as the candidates are going through the e-learning um, modules, they're also creating or com completing a, a summative portfolio. And our idea here was that the portfolio would address the, um, the skills component of knowledge, skills, and abilities. So here, here they would show their ability to create a lesson plan or you know, write a coaching philosophy. Um, as far as developing the instructional strategy, um, you know, there are several things that I showed you. Number one being adult learning. Um, developing instructional materials. For this, we looked at old manuals. We um, created working groups for each discipline to work together to put content together. And we also, you know, used the, the internet and, and looked at a ton of um, educational websites. Uh, develop and conduct formative evaluation. Um, the working groups review the final content, and course evaluation will be conducted by a focus group, as I uh, noted earlier. And then develop and conduct summative evaluation. Candidate assessment scores and Candidate clinician surveys will be evaluated. We're not quite there yet. We're still in the developmental phase, but that's our plan. Um, I showed you the coaching roles and responsibilities, and I think that's a wrap. Sam, I'll uh, turn it over you, to you. For oh, sorry about that. <clears throat> All right. If uh, anybody has any questions, if you just want to, like, uh, Type your name in the chat box with a question and stuff, and I'll unmute you so you can ask a question rather than me trying to read it back to folks. Um, so, you know, many times I wait for people to maybe think around that. Uh, Chris, thanks a lot. Thanks for sharing some of the resources that you've discovered. Um, I, I think that's one of the things there's so much out there that um, if we can all pull this to learn about things like adapt, that, um, the open source one. And H5P and some of those things, I think that may help a lot of us. And um, to share you know, what we're finding out there and, and how we're using it can be really good. Um, I 
Well, I'm going to request for folks. If you know of topics or you've got something you think would be useful to the group, please shoot me an email. I'm working on uh, a presenter for November and I'm looking at, um, I'm going to stop the recording here. Hey, this is just testing the microphone out to see how the sound quality is, to see if it's the microphone or if it's the recording.